Podcast 8 of the Abdomen Series The Arteries and Portal System of the Abdomen This podcast is going to review the three main arteries that supply the abdominal viscera and it will also detail the portal system by describing the formation of the hepatic portal vein. So if we start with the arterial system, then the arterial supply to the gastrointestinal organs within the abdomen is from three principal arteries, the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric artery, and the inferior mesenteric artery. These unpaired arteries originate from the aorta, which enters the abdomen through the aortic hiatus of the diaphragm at T12, and it descends retroperitoneal to bifurcate into two common iliac arteries at the level of the L4-5 intervertebral disc. Each of these three principal arteries supply a specific group of organs of the gastrointestinal tract that is dependent on the organ's embryological origin, as during development the gastrointestinal tract is divided into three regions, the foregut, the midgut and the hindgut. The foregut includes the abdominal part of the esophagus, the stomach and the proximal part of the duodenum up to the major duodenal papilla. It also includes the spleen, pancreas and liver. And all of these organs are going to be supplied by branches originating from the celiac trunk. The midgut extends from the distal half of the duodenum and it includes the jejunum, the ileum, cecum and appendix, the ascending colon and up to the first two-thirds of the transverse colon. And all of these organs are going to be supplied by branches originating from the superior mesenteric artery. And then finally, the hindgut. This extends from the last third of the transverse colon, the descending and sigmoid colon, and the superior part of the rectum. And all of these organs are going to be supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. So let's describe these three arteries and their branches, starting with the celiac trunk. The celiac trunk is a short, stubby artery that branches from the abdominal aorta at the level of the 12th thoracic vertebra. As the celiac trunk is only about one centimetre long, it quickly gives off three branches. There's the splenic artery, the left gastric artery, and the common hepatic artery. These three arteries are then going to give off various branches that supply all of the organs of the foregut. So let's start with the splenic artery. This is the largest branch of the celiac trunk and it takes a tortuous course along the superior border of the pancreas to enter the spleen at its hilum. As it extends to the spleen, it gives off a series of pancreatic arteries that supply the pancreas and short gastric arteries that supply the fundus and posterior surface of the stomach. As it approaches the spleen, it also gives off the left gastroamental artery and this runs along the greater curvature of the stomach. The second and much smaller branch of the celiac trunk is the left gastric artery. This artery ascends towards the esophageal hiatus and it gives off some esophageal branches and then runs within the lesser omentum to supply the lesser curvature of the stomach. The third branch of the celiac trunk is the common hepatic artery. This artery travels to the right and divides, giving off the gastroduodenal artery. The gastroduodenal artery is a fairly large branch that itself quickly divides into the right gastroamental artery and also the supraduodenal artery. The right gastroamental artery runs along the greater curvature of the stomach to anastomose with the left gastroamental artery. The supraduodenal artery supplies the duodenum. An important branch to come from the right gastroamental artery is the superior pancreaticoduodenal artery and I mentioned this artery a few times in previous podcasts and I'll detail it again in a bit more detail when I describe the superior mesenteric artery later in the podcast. If we return to the common hepatic artery then once it is given off the gastroduodenal it extends towards the liver and gives off the right gastric artery 
This artery runs to the lesser curvature of the stomach and anastomoses with the left gastric artery. Once the right gastric artery has emerged, the common hepatic artery becomes the hepatic artery proper and it extends to the liver in the free edge of the lesser omentum as part of the portal triad. As it enters the portal hepatis, it divides into the left and right hepatic arteries, which supply the left and right functional parts of the liver. Normally coming from the right hepatic artery is the small cystic artery, and this extends to the gallbladder running alongside the cystic duct. So from this description, you should be able to recognise that the stomach is surrounded by two anastomotic rings derived from the celiac trunk. So if we follow the larger of these two rings first, then originating from the celiac trunk is the splenic artery. This then gives rise to the left gastromental artery, and this anastomoses with the right gastromental artery along the greater curvature of the stomach. Now we know the right gastromental artery is a branch from the gastroduodenal artery, and the gastroduodenal comes from the common hepatic, which is a direct branch of the celiac trunk. So you can see running along the greater curvature of the stomach is an anastomotic ring that starts and ends at the celiac trunk. The second anastomotic ring is shorter, but it also starts and finishes at the celiac trunk. This time there's the left gastric artery, which comes from the celiac trunk, and this anastomoses with the right gastric artery along the lesser curvature of the stomach. Now the right gastric artery comes from the common hepatic artery, and the common hepatic artery comes from the celiac trunk. So here we've got two anastomotic rings that circuit around the stomach, providing with a plentiful supply of oxygen to aid the digestion process. Now let's move to the superior mesenteric artery. This artery originates slightly inferior to the celiac trunk, at the L1 vertebral level, and is slightly longer. It is the main artery of the midgut, and runs within the roots of the mesentery to supply the small and parts of the large intestines. Now branching from the superior mesenteric artery in a clockwise direction are the jejunal and ileal arteries, then there's the iliocolic, the right colic, middle colic and finally the inferior pancreatico-duodenal artery. As it runs along the posterior abdominal wall in line with the roots of the mesentery, it sends jejunal and ileal branches to the left in between these two layers of the mesentery. The iliocolic artery extends retroperitoneal towards the ileocecal junction, supplying the distal ilium, cecum and ascending colon. Coming off the iliocolic artery is the appendicular artery, which supplies the appendix by running through the mesoappendix. Also running retroperitoneal is the right colic artery, and this supplies the ascending colon, then there's the middle colic artery, which also starts retroperitoneal, and then ascends towards the transverse colon between the two layers of the transverse mesocolon. The final branch from the superior mesenteric artery to detail is the inferior pancreatico-duodenal artery. The inferior pancreatico-duodenal artery forms numerous anastomoses with the superior pancreatico-duodenal artery, supplying both the pancreas and the duodenum. This extensive collateral circulation is a site of transition between the blood supply of the foregut and the midgut. Now let's turn to the inferior mesenteric artery. The inferior mesenteric artery originates from the L3 vertebral level and supplies the hindgut organs. And this includes the last third of the transverse colon, the descending and sigmoid colon, and the superior parts of the rectum. Coming from the inferior mesenteric artery are the left colic, sigmoidal and superior rectal arteries. The left colic extends retroperitoneal to the left, supplying the descending colon. The sigmoid artery extends towards the sigmoid colon between the two layers of the sigmoid mesocolon, and the superior rectal arteries travel inferiorly to supply the superior part of the rectum. Now just like the pancreatico-duodenal arteries, 
with a site of transition between the blood supply to the foregut and midgut, the colic arteries from both the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries are a site of transition between the blood supply of the midgut and hindgut. This transition is the marginal artery. The marginal artery runs parallel to the colon and has the right, middle and left colic arteries running into it. The arrangement of the marginal artery means that blood from the middle colic artery can travel along the marginal artery and supply portions of the hindgut, even though it is derived from the superior mesenteric artery. This arrangement ensures that the hindgut is supplied with blood even if the inferior mesenteric artery becomes occluded due to atherosclerosis. So in this first part of the podcast, you should be aware that the foregut is supplied by the celiac trunk and this artery leaves the aorta at the 12th thoracic vertebral level. The midgut is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery, which originates from the aorta at the L1 vertebral level, and the hindgut is supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery, which originates from the L3 vertebral level. It is important to mention at this point that although the description given and the pictures and textbooks makes the arterial arrangement seem relatively simple, the exact distribution and course of these arteries can vary considerably from person to person. So it is important to have a good theoretical understanding and then apply this knowledge to your cadaver. So in the second part of the podcast, I want to detail the portal system of veins and also the portal systemic anastomoses. The portal system of veins collects blood of reduced oxygen content but high in nutrients from the abdominal organs in order to pass them to the liver for detoxification. The principal vein of this system is the hepatic portal vein and this is formed posterior to the neck of the pancreas by the union of the splenic and superior mesenteric veins. The splenic vein is draining blood from the spleen, whilst the superior mesenteric veins is draining blood from the midgut. Venous blood from the stomach drains directly into the portal vein via the gastric veins, and venous blood from the hindgut also forms part of this system, with the inferior mesenteric vein draining into the splenic vein posterior to the body of the pancreas. So these veins ensure that all the nutrients absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract pass to the liver for detoxification. As the hepatic portal vein is formed, it extends to the liver by running in the free edge of the lesser omentum, alongside the hepatic artery and bile duct. As it enters the liver, it divides into the left and right branches, which go to the left and right functional parts of the liver. Now throughout the portal system, the veins are in connection with the systemic system via a series of porta systemic anastomoses. And these anastomoses occur at three sites. There is the esophageal vein that links the gastric veins to the ozygous system, the power umbilical vein that links the portal vein to the epigastric vein, and the inferior rectal veins that link the superior rectal vein to the common iliac vein. This system is important in shunting blood from the portal system to the systemic system during periods of reduced blood flow through the liver with liver disease. This series of anastomoses ensures that the blood destined for the liver can still be returned to the inferior vena cava via these alternative routes. Commonly, these pathways are utilised during portal hypertension, where the presence of a liver tumour or substantial architectural damage due to liver cirrhosis impedes the flow of venous blood through the liver and this increases the blood pressure within this portal system. This results in large amounts of venous blood leaving the portal system and entering the systemic system via these porta systemic anastomoses. However, because the veins that form this system are fairly small, an increase in blood results in them dilating forming varicoses. These varicoses can occur in the lower part of the esophagus and are likely to rupture, leading to haemorrhage. And this condition can be fatal with the patients often coughing up blood. Alternatively, varicose veins can form in the power umbilical veins that run in the anterior abdominal wall 
and this causes the anterior abdominal wall to be elevated into a series of snake-like ridges radiating from the umbilicus, and this is known as caput medusa, as it resembles the serpents on the head of medusa from Greek mythology. Finally, raricus veins formed in the rectal veins can bulge through the walls of the rectum, resulting in hemorrhoids or piles. So in this podcast, I've given a brief overview of the arteries and portal system of the abdomen. In the next podcast, number eight, I'll describe the posterior abdominal wall.